way we're organized today, he may just have one brigade from the 82nd, may have a brigade from the 101st, and he may have the 256 Brigade from the Louisiana Army National Guard. And that's because as we work to maintain and ensure bog dwell times for all of our soldiers, active and reserve component, uh, this is really a, a Army Army Force generation model, not an AC, not an Army Reserve, but a, a complete total Army uh, Force generation model. And, and I think it's important that everybody that wears the United States Army uniform out there that that you understand and you communicate the 152090 and what it means to the Army because we, we've had the discussions uh, for some, some time now uh, about access. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to going to argue whether there's access or not access, but what I do know is a lot of that uh, is hinged on political will, uh, national will, and the ability for uh, those that we serve to understand how the Army is going to operate. And they have to understand that the Army doesn't go to war without its reserve components anymore, and we all need to communicate that to, to our civilian leadership. Um, as you all have probably heard in this convention, in fact, there's a couple of uh, panels that address this specifically, but you'll, if you haven't heard about it, you will. Um, there's been almost 10 different studies done in the Department of Defense um, looking at the role of the reserve components and the question of access that Tim Cadovy just brought up. I would argue that the most important and probably the best in form of that studies was the one, or the panel that's just recently concluded their findings and recommendations led by General Dennis Reimer. With him, he's had um, Lieutenant uh, General Schultz from the Army Guard, Lieutenant General Humley from the Army Reserve, and all these guys are very experienced senior leaders who've done this whole thing up to and include the early part of this current war. It's interesting because one of the things they realized when they looked at it is they realized two interesting points. The first is, as I mentioned in my comments at the outset, the, the decision to employ the uh, the Guard and Reserve is a national decision and it's, it's a constitutional decision and it's not taken lightly. But many of the sub-decisions that flow from that are policy decisions. So for example, in units of the Air National Guard and the Air Force Reserve, there are airmen who have orders and they already know that if their cell phone goes off, 96 hours later, there'll be a Tinker Air Force Base boarding a fuel tanker that'll be heading over to the Northern Arabian Sea to refuel fighter aircraft. And that's just their mission that their unit does, and they've done it many times, and they train for it. When you begin to talk about Army Guard or Army Reserve units, people want to impose a 30-day clock because that has always been the policy. And it's based on an old system where, literally, if you want to go back to the, to the 1800s, you had to get word out to the person who would drop their plow or drop their tools and go get their weapon and then go have to report to an armory and have to get their uniform on and all that kind of stuff. Look, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, our Army Guard and Reserve today are very combat experienced. They have a, a, a strong proportion of their element that are active Guard and Reserve who are always at work and available, and that they can much more quickly move out. So you had a very strange phenomenon in January when uh, the earthquake hit the island of Haiti. Um, if you would look at the war plans that we maintain in the Department of Defense and Department of the Army and the various other headquarters, you would have seen that the unit that would have responded to that humanitarian crisis in Haiti caused by the earthquake in Port-au-Prince and the regions around there would have been the 377th Theater Support Command, a very, very experienced Army Reserve formation with a full range of capabilities that would have acted as the higher headquarters working under U.S. Army South and U.S. Southern Command. Unfortunately, because of the policies in place, people thought they needed to give those people 30 days notice before they brought them in, even though we literally had those guys calling us and saying, hey, we're ready to go. We know what's going on in Haiti. We got our ad bond ready to launch. We're ready to go. Instead, what we did is we defaulted literally to the last time we went into Haiti, and we pulled up the 18th Airborne Corps, which is a great formation and is ready to go. And thank God that General Helmick and the guys had kept them ready. And they launched the 18th Airborne Corps into Haiti, and they did a great job, and the 377th then came in. But we need some different policies in the Army that mirror what our brothers and sisters <coughs> in the Air Force and the Air Guard and Air Reserve have. And I can tell you, these gentlemen will tell you the same for our Army Reserve and Army National Guard. And I'd be interested for many Guardsmen and Reservists in the, in the uh, group here if you have any different views. But I think our Guardsmen and Reservists are an operational force and want the policies to match that. They no longer want this, this lengthy mobilization period for every single deployment. If that deployment matches their medal and they're in the available pool for that year, they need to go and they will be ready to go. As we've told them that, we've prepared them for that. 
Any comments from you guys? Uh, sir, just to amplify that last point, uh, you know, we've been at war for eight plus years. Uh, since that time, what has happened is at the beginning uh, of the conflict, there were uh, reserve component soldiers who probably thought, hey, I signed up for a big war and, have a and, and to play a strategic role. Those soldiers, m more often than not, deployed one time, said, I've served my, con my country admirably, and, uh, but now it's somebody else's turn and they've left our formations. What has happened is the vast majority of the reservists that, uh, that exist today have joined since 9-11 and have stayed in the formations and, and in many instances deployed not just once but two and three times. So people are coming to the reserve component knowing about this operational reserve, participating in it, and choosing to stay. So the, the old paradigm, I think, doesn't exist. And to, to your point, uh, the, the soldiers really do want to serve, and more specifically in some of the formations that, that were called up to respond to Haiti and then found the policy challenges that uh, General Bolger just referred to, um, they, they get a very high percentage of their soldiers showing up uh, voluntarily uh, at their reserve centers or at their armories. Uh, they they uh, are near 100 percent and people are excited to go because that's why they put the uniform on, to do exactly those kinds of things. So uh, I, I couldn't endorse what you said uh, more, sir. Well, sir, I, I would just add uh, to what General Miller said that our concern today is with all the soldiers who are recruited understanding they were joining an operational reserve is how do we train, retain them if we don't stay as an operational reserve. That's our concern today. These soldiers have been deployed once, twice in many cases and they expect to be utilized as part of that operational force. Yeah, and I th with that, back to the comment about, about uh, you know, money that needs to be allocated, an operationalized reserve is more expensive than a reserve that's being used only for a major war or strategic. Uh, because all those soldiers that are brought on active duty, the longer they spend on active duty, obviously you have their payroll and things like that, but you also have health care issues, you have family support issues. Until now, frankly, uh, until this last decade, the United States uh, was able to get their Army Reserve and their Army National Guard very much on the cheap in that they kept all those forces and they were on the books, but they didn't have to pay them a lot of those benefits. Now they're realizing you want to keep those quality soldiers in the Guard and Reserve, you have to give them the, the pay that keeps those volunteers coming back. And, and again, um, those benefits are substantial, but I would tell you that the, uh, the benefit that the country gains from paying them is very substantial in terms of the the wide range of capabilities it gives us as a, as a total force. Yes, sir. Um, General, you said um, quality costs, and there's, there's absolutely no doubting uh, the, the standard of the U.S. Army today. Um, if you recruit the, the top 30% of your new, you, you have an equipment standard that no one can match, you prepare your forces brilliantly, you support them superbly on operations, and you support the family and the warriors. Um, but as we go through current campaigns, and perhaps the 9-11 go back to full spectrum operations and use Secretary Gates' expression, the gusher is turned off. Um, you're now to stand which no ally can match and which overpaces any, uh, any conceivable opponent. Do you think you can sustain the gold standard in the future? And if not, where might you begin to make trades? I think that's a great question from General Barons and, and a question that if you all are following the news, you know that the British Army and, and the other British <coughs> forces are having to look at themselves. Um, those of you all who've served with our British forces, and most of us have, know that they are a very high quality force and have been for quite a while. But their government has already raised that very issue in the recent white paper. And, and ladies and gentlemen, again, you do not have to you know, follow everything that appears on MSNBC or on the front page of your newspaper to realize that our country will shortly have a, a, an election, a national election, and that there will undoubtedly be some consequences on that for defense. I think our challenge as the military is always to make the case for what can we provide for the resources that we're given and to use those resources most effectively. And Richard, you asked about trades, and I, I would give examples. If full spectrum operations is our goal, one of the trades that we can offer is to say, do we emphasize professional military education and make sure that people are at least getting the schooling necessary? to do full spectrum operations, even if our operational tempo does not allow us to get out in the field and do it as much as we want. I mentioned 
General Jim Huggins has the one brigade right now that's doing that. Well, that means there's 72 other brigade combat teams that are not doing those type of operations. So can at least get to the professional schooling, which is not as expensive, that'll allow people to work on that. Are there simulation devices or training expedients that allow you to do this training in a way that saves some money in terms of transportation costs? I mentioned that unit rotation is, is um, expensive. One of the aspects that's expensive is moving equipment around. Uh, when units leave equipment in theater, they need equipment at home station to train. And that equipment has to be moved across the United States and in some cases across oceans so that units have a set to train. Is there a, a set of equipment that units could share? One unit would use it while they're in home station, the other would unit would use it when they come back. We certainly do that with our forward-based equipment. Those would be expedients that I do believe we're going to have to look very closely at. And I think the other, the other challenge that we've got to do is as military folks, um, we have to give our best military advice to our, our political leadership as to what the trade-offs are. At a certain point, you cannot do more with less. Um, there is an important aspect of quality and quali quantity, and you have to have both. If you go to a smaller quality force, it can only be in so many places at one time. And I think, I think it will be very instructive for us to, to talk to our allies and to look at those that are going through this experience and see the kind of strategic trade-offs that they had to ask. Uh, that they had to uh, consider and that they had to present as questions uh, for their senior leaders to ask. But uh, there's no doubt about it. We are going to have to face that particular challenge. You cannot look at the United States national debt figures or what's likely to happen in terms of elections and things and thinks that, that the Department of Defense will continue to draw the amount of money that they have without questions being asked. It's got to be looked at. And uh, and I think it will, it will come to a head fairly soon because there's there's going to have to be decisions made as to what our relationship is with the country of Iraq after the 31st of December of 2011. Um, you just have to pull out a map to know who their neighbors are to realize that the country of Iraq is going to have some challenges on the security and defense front, and they're going to want some help. And how much help we can provide and for how long and in what nature is, is certainly going to drive, I think, a debate in the United States. One other thing I might add that's indicative, by the way, of what a good job the U.S. military has done and the U.S. Army total force in particular is that in the current campaign, the one thing that is not an issue in this election for a change since 9-11 is the military and defense. Because you notice you hear very, very few comments about it. Um, in some ways, we've probably done too well because uh, we do need to be discussed as, as one of the issues. But I think once the election is resolved, uh, we will come back on the chart as something that needs to be looked at. If you are not aware, you should be, that in the discretionary United States budget, the Department of Defense is the largest single item um, it accounts for about two-thirds of the discretionary budget of the U.S. government. Great question. We'll, uh, we'll look to you, and once you get it sorted out, we'll follow your mom. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Yes, sir. Does anyone have a question? Sir, if I could just add one piece or jump on. Sure. I just would echo your thoughts, sir, in terms of the relocating the force. I know What we can, Jim, General Jim, Jim Huggins is a commander of the 82nd Airborne Division, raises a really good point that, that is 
as military folks and as people who support and interested in the military, we've got to do, and that is if there is in fact a reduction in our op tempo like we believe there will be and we go to one to two, one to four, we can ill afford to now take a little break, although that'll, we'll want to, believe me, we can ill afford to take a little break and settle on our laurels with the current formations because these were expedients, they met the need in the middle part of this decade. We now need to go to the next level, follow our own doctrine and tradition, <coughs> give ourselves a hard and unblinking after action review on what we've done to ourselves, and make the adjustments and changes because as we all know from training, it's very easy to identify lessons. The hard part is to learn the lessons and then to apply what you've learned. That's the mark of a truly uh, outstanding and disciplined force. Well, thank you very much. It's been a, it's been a great panel. I, I'd like to make one comment about you know, where are we headed for in the future. Uh, we have to be very careful in what we do with this because at the end of the Cold War, uh, there were a lot of people that started to talk about you guys, the military, have to think outside the box. And we had a great uh, naval commander down in Norfolk. I learned how to say Norfolk after I've lived there for a while, uh, who decided that the next carrier battle group he was going to send over to the Med was going to be thought about in a way outside the box. And so he put on board that carrier an 800-man Marine battalion, and he used some helicopters and took away some of the fixed-wing uh, combat aircraft that normally goes on a carrier. And they shipped that over to the combatant commander, who said, what the hell is this? What do you want me to do with this? So whatever changes are going to come into the future for land combat, for air combat, for maritime combat, we are, in fact, going to have to make sure that we have what is necessary as we hand it to a combatant commander charged with doing certain missions. So how the, th how the threat changes or how the perceived threat changes is going to require an awful lot of thought. It's not going to come out of a couple of guys sitting around a, a fire some night saying, have we ever thought about doing this? Because you can end up having half your carrier battle group being sent back, hauling Marines and helicopters, and more aircraft being flown over there to get on the helicopter, get on the aircraft carrier. These are the challenges. We faced them after the end of the Cold War. We faced them after the end of Vietnam. We went through them. At the end of Vietnam, we did not have a non-commissioned officer corps, and we had to set up all of our non-commissioned officer educational training programs. And then we had to go move into a volunteer army. And it took us 10 years under that to start to change our army to what it, what it started to become and what was ready for Desert Storm. We have the things in place now to allow us to change much faster. And if we think about it right, if we socialize the strategy, if we bring our combatant commanders into it, the Joint Force commanders, and they tell us this is what I need, this is what I want, then we'll change it to force. And it'll be able to change much easier and much faster than we did it at the end of any of these other wars. So thank you very much. I want to thank the panel. I think it's a great, uh, a great subject that they covered. Our 4 Gen is this huge machine that's got many, many wheels in it that are moving around. And you start to make a change on one, and some of the other outputs start to change on the other end. And so this is what they've been able to do. This is a balancing act that's had to take place from all elements of the force, from the active component, from the reserve, from the National Guard, and from the reserve on how do we fit all these things together. So what comes out at the end of that is a combat brigade or a support brigade going over there to do a mission specifically known in advance what it is. We're not going to have that luxury all the time in the future when you move to a variety of different tasks to a variety of different forces, to a, dry, to a variety of different combatant commands. So thank you very much. You guys did a great job. Appreciate it.